At the last convention I was at, I was actually approached by a fan. It was really, really flattering because her boyfriend uh, dragged her up and said that she was really nervous to meet me. I've been on that exchange where you're approaching someone and you're like super duper nervous and you don't know what to say. So I've been where that person was at before and it's really weird and thank you so much. You really made my weekend and it was, it was really nice to meet you. So this fan that approached me was named Hale Helix and she had a bunch of different questions for me and a lot of them were really, really good and really insightful questions. So I decided rather than answer them a bunch of times to whoever may uh, want to ask that again, I'm gonna go ahead and turn her questions into a small video series. If you have any questions you want me to answer, go ahead and leave them down in the comments comments below and I'll try to get to them. The first question that Hale Helix asked me was specifically, how do you write villains that you love to hate? Well, in reality, it's not super difficult. There's only like two or three real requirements. The first real requirement is you have to make them unapologetic. Essentially speaking, they should not feel sorry for what they've done and immediately you take a lot of redemption or a lot of like good qualities away from them. If you get a villain that's too sympathetic, the party may want to work with them and may try to redeem them. That's fun in their own right. But if you want a villain that you love to hate, like that we had in Donovan Michaels, uh, by the way, go ahead and check out that video wherever the heck the little card will pop up. Go ahead and check out that D&D story on probably my most hated character ever. But if you want to write somebody that you love to hate, you need to make it so that they do not feel bad about their actions. The second requirement for villains that you love to hate, super duper easy. You gotta make it kind of douchey. Here's the thing when people write villains that are, that, or people are trying to write villains for D&D campaigns, they'll often try to make some kind of dark lord that's just killing people indiscriminately. And a lot, it's really hard to relate to that in today's terms. A weird example, Hitler. Hitler is the worst, most evil person that has probably been born in the modern age. But people don't have a lot of personal hatred for him. It's really, really hard unless you were directly affected by him. He killed a lot of people, but like when you say three million people died to this person, that's, it's hard to quantify and it's hard to make that relatable. Hey guys, Editing Stuart here. Did that explanation make you cringe a little bit? That's okay. It, it probably should have. I'm still getting used to this whole, um, like, D&D advice thing. Anyway, there's a video online by a guy named Unique... Unique... Unique. There's a guy named Unique, and he created a video that explained why Dolores Unbridge is actually a better villain than Voldemort. It kind of explains the whole... You know, the whole bad guy thing a little bit better than I did right here. So if you feel my explanation needs a little bit more context as to where my thinking was going, feel free to go ahead and click on that title card happening right now. Anyway, back on with the video. When writing an actual villain, you gotta make it kinda personal and really douchey. Two kinda ties into three. Make it more personal than making it, like, general. Like, if this guy is going around slaughtering villages, or if they're going around, like, killing lots of people at once, it's really hard to re relate to that personally. What is better is if someone steals something from the party. Back in my Sands of Horan campaign, the party came across like this floating platform. It was like a technological, it was almost like a cargo pusher that they could kind of ride. And they got really attached to this particular cargo pusher because it was special and it was neat and it was uh, unique just to them. And I had some guys just take it from them. And for a short time, like, their their sole goal in life was to go and kill these, like, d stupid bastards that went and stole their stuff. Yeah, th essentially, that's, that's, that's the final thing. Like, don't make it, it's, it's not super difficult. Make them unapologetic, make it douchey, make it personal. Bam, there's your three requirements for villains that you love to hate. But let's go ahead and take this a little bit further because you don't want to just write like an average villain. You want to write a BBEG, a big, bad, evil guy. Everyone wants those for those campaigns and it's really, really easy to mess them up. The big, bad, evil guys almost always have some kind of like world ending plan. Like they're going to summon this great demon lore that'll rain fire or they're going to sacrifice a million people in order to make some kind of MacGuffin that'll 
let them accomplish their goals, or they're like some god trying to enter the world. They're really, really like difficult to get right because essentially their goals stretch outside the realms of reality. W remember, when it comes to D&D, you want to make it believable enough that the players do not have to stretch their suspension of disbelief, and they want they you want them to want to defeat the BBEG. So, here are some best practices for writing a big bad evil guy. First of all, what you want to do with a big bad evil guy is you want to build a sense of dread. You want to make their presence known to the party before the character is actually within their line of sight. Japanese horror movies probably do this the best out of anyone. If you've ever seen The Grudge, there's a sound that the ghost makes that just like still bothers people to this day. That movie wasn't super fantastic, but that noise j like announces The Grudge's presence before they even show up. That fika sound is one of the most like terrifying and like awful noises that has ever been put to cinema because like yeah, it, it builds up so much tension before the creature actually appears. So with your big bad evil guy, you want to do something to make it known to the players that they're there. So good example of this and the campaigns that I've played, I've had two villains that I'm really, really happy with. One in my Sands of Salabim campaign was the Iron Squid. Now the Iron Squid was a mind flayer whose half of his body was destroyed and was replaced with cybernetics. So whenever the Iron Squid walks, they they make like a they have like a weird walking gait and you can hear their metallic foot hit the floor. So they hear that villain before they ever see him. In my Pokemon D&D campaign, the main villain is a rogue Celebi who was uh, damaged heavily in her past. She's got like a burnt face and uh, she's slightly poisoned. In the Pokedex entry for Celebi, she is known as the Onion Fairy. So whenever she appears, she has the smell of burnt onions. And so the players, the characters smell that way before they ever see her. And that's how they know that she's there and she's coming for them. Right away, you, you've got this villain whose like aura is there even before the players ever see them. So so let's say building a villain, let, let's say just like a fire demon, like your fire demon is your big bad evil guy. And as they get angry, as they get angry and approach, the room gets hot and hotter. Use some kind of descriptive word, like you smell sulfur and your skin begins to coil a little bit. Like use very specific words that you will only attribute to that bad guy. You want to make it so that the players know it's them before they show up. And this gives the party time to run away. And you can do this with just about every, anything. Telegraphing it for the players makes so much more of an impact. Like in Lord of the Rings, Frodo had Sting, a sword that glowed blue as orcs were getting closer. They got a bit of a warning and that let them prepare a little bit and it, it, it kind of built anticipation for the battle. Secondly, when it comes to big bad evil guys, you want to make them really, really powerful. You want to make it believable that they can be beaten. It, it, this is really, really hard to balance, especially since games like D&D and role-playing games like that are basically giant number games. Ugh. So essentially speaking, either leave like a MacGuffin around for the players to use whenever the big bad evil guy gets near, or like give them some kind of weakness that is attainable, but scarce enough for them to be scrambling whenever it happens. My personal favorite thing is to give uh, the big bad evil guy some kind of phobia. Whenever you make this kind of weakness, you also kind of want to tie it into their past a bit. So like, let's say the character was burnt and scarred. You could make their weakness fire, but that may be a little too common. Or maybe like there's some kind of item that sparked the fire that could kind of like trigger some bad memories or something, or like lower their guard. Give the player something that can weaken the big bad at least for a time. Maybe not outright kill them, probably 
definitely not outright kill them, but you want to at least be able to fend them off when they show up. Also with the big bad evil guy, you're probably gonna want to give them a little bit something unique that the players can't attain. So for example, maybe they got like some kind of magic sword or they have some kind of magical powers that the uh, party cannot access. In my Pokemon tabletop game, my big bad evil guy, uh, you know, Sarah, she had access to a time gear which let her rewind and fast forward time as needed. Now, she never got to use it because of the situations of the campaign, but if you want to find out more about that, go ahead and check out our campaigns up there. Also, throughout the campaign, you want to make it so that your big bad evil guy has some kind of impact in the world. As the party starts accomplishing goals that either thwart or uh, stop or hinder the big bad evil guy, you want the big bad evil guy to gradually start impacting their environment. Say for example, like let's say the, the party's working with this town and they thwart the bad guy for a while. Maybe, maybe they save the town, but like the neighboring town next door gets destroyed instead. Or maybe like the, uh, let's say you, you're fighting some kind of fire demon or something. Let's say they, they fought off the fire demon, but instead of that person like, I don't know, harvesting, you know, a bunch of souls, they go into the forest and like kill a bunch of animals. And because of that, let's say druids are angry that this occurred. Like every single like success should come with a drawback. There needs to be consequences to what the players do in relation to what the bad guy wants. So the bad guy is trying to accomplish his goals and they generally have their own resources. Like almost never should you have a big bad evil guy by themselves. You want them to have like a network of lesser bosses to go with them. You want this not only to make the big bad evil guy more relatable, but you're also setting goals for the players to defeat. I can't defeat Sarah right now, but I might be able to defeat like Layla or Akimoto, or e even I might be able to defeat Watashi. Like silly things like that sets like scaffolding goals that eventually lead up to the defeat of the big bad evil guy. In order to write a big bad evil guy, you don't have to do too many things. I mean, you're going to have to put a lot of work into it. You need to make a, uh, a backstory and you need, to, you need to fully understand it as you are playing your campaign. You need to give them goals and you need to give them ways to accomplish the goals. You need to make it so that their uh, impact has an effect on the world. You need to make their presence known to the party before the party fights with them. And of course, you're going to want to give them some kind of power or some kind of ability or some kind of thing that puts them one level above everyone else. And that's basically it. If you want more of these like GM tips or GM's guides, be sure to comment below and check out our other D&D campaigns so that way you haven't, <laughs> so that way, uh, you know, it sounds like I actually know what the heck I'm talking about and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.